you know, I hope everyone's enjoying this, and I think we're just a couple minutes away <laughs> from uh, bringing on Chris. I, I see Chris, Chris is, is here, yeah. Chris is already on, so actually, you know, why keep the guy waiting? I mean, Chris, if you're ready. Uh, Welcome, Chris. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you, I, I've always, uh, I've seen you on Twitter and, you know, some of your work, and I've been looking forward to having a chance to talk to you. Uh, for people that don't know Chris, he's uh, head of research for Pepperstone, been in the markets for a couple of decades, and you've worked, uh, you know, at Credit Suisse, Morgan Stanley, and your exposure FX equities fix into put you in a unique position uh, for looking at intermarket things. You have kind of a holistic approach to the market. You look at the whole jigsaw puzzle, and uh, you've been on, you know, all the major financial work, uh, uh, networks like Bloomberg, CNBC, and probably over there, Sky News, right? That's probably on that side of uh, the world. So, yeah. uh, so Chris, uh, welcome. Uh, Thanks, I don't know if you, uh, Dale, uh, it's a good opportunity to also remind people that haven't heard Pepperstone. of the previous days that, yes, yeah. Forex Analytics and Pepperstone yeah. uh, collaborate, collaborate with each other. Uh, tight. Yes, very tight. So uh, actually, uh, people can take advantage of, of this. Um, if you go to Forex Analytics, there is a link you can see them sharing my screen. You can see it on the top right. It's, it's called Forex Analytics Sponsored. And if you actually open a Pepperstone account, which you can do from, uh, remind me if I'm mistaken about this, uh, Chris, from any, any um, country on the planet with the exception of um, yeah, US and Canada, am I right about that? Um, not not every country. Um, Almost every country on the planet, with, with the exception. There's, there's, of the a, there's a lot of countries, to be honest. We're regulated yes. in, in, in in quite a few of these days. If so, I if yeah, I move to check. Tasmania, Chris, can I open an account? Well, it's part of Australia. So <laughs> absolutely, hundred percent. Oh, see, I it's didn't even know where it was. You you know. Yeah, you should definitely have a look at it. It gets cold at this time of year, though. <laughs> so, That's if, right, you, if you actually right. open a Pepperstone account through this uh, link on our site, specifically this one, because this is the only way we can track it, uh, and you fund your account, you actually get two months of Forex Analytics for free, and you get another two months if you do uh, five lots, uh, which is really insignificant within two months to trade. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I assume everybody's going to do that. So uh, I, I strongly suggest taking advantage of that offer. Pepperstone is uh, an amazing brokerage firm. There's no question about it. Um, I, I think enough said about that. Uh, Chris, I'm going to, uh, you know, let you uh, take it over and uh, see what you have to tell us today. Uh, so, Chris, is this uh, just going to be uh, an interview format, or do you have any presentation? I've got, I've, I've got a, um, I've got a slide deck actually, which I'm, I'm okay. trying to, I'm trying to share the screen now. You, sh you should be able now that I stopped sharing mine. You should be able to do it. Green. Okay. There you go. It's coming up. There you go. Okay. So, so what I've done is I've, I've actually, I've put a, a huge deck together, um, which okay. is part of the framework, which I'm, I'm sort of hosting to clients anyway because i mean you you're um all the speakers that you've had i mean there would have been quite a few who would have been talking about you know the current fed policy the move to yeah. flexible average inflation targeting the idea that real rates are driving the show these days if you get your dollar call right you're doing pretty much you, you're going some way but it's it's just all sort of one big correlated trade so it sort of took a bit of time to to put a deck together um for for trading this and this is part of my framework because you know, whilst I'm, I trade markets, I have a, a top-down framework by trying to understand what's making things make move, what's making things tick. Okay. You know, and I think from from once you understand how things are interacting with each other, that can be really powerful for you know just understanding you know for your risk management. Um, you can go into the, a lot of the option structures and and, and use that um, that volatility for 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 position sizing and various factors. But I I want to just go over the sort of top-down framework today, just a little bit about. Right. Chris, have you ever seen the markets being so binary uh, and tied together where like almost there's hardly any differentiation, maybe different degrees of magnitude, but pretty much everything's going up together and everything's going down together? Have you ever seen a period in the wow. market like this? I mean, this, this is a... 
this is an int- I mean, there's there's always there's always times where correlations go to one. They usually obviously correlate with when 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 you get implied volatility moving up exceptionally sharply, and we've still got you know quite elevated levels of implied volatility in equities. Um, right. But I, th- I think you know there's two things which are driving the show at the moment, and um, that is real rates and the dollar. And and it's I think it. you know once yeah. you, once you've got those two things in place, you can you, you're getting what, what's happening with the Nasdaq. You're getting your your gold trade right, right. You know, your growth stocks, all of that. So like all of those are it's, that that's all really one trade. And then you've got to look at the different players who are involved. You know your systematic guys, your CTAs, your momentum. It's a momentum trade. The question right. is, is is when does that end? And that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm I really want to focus on so we'll focus right. on on that one trade there i just want to just come out and just give the disclaimer here that, that what i say today is going to be general advice um so yeah i mean i'm, I'm happy to go through the slides um because I, I want to start off dale and and you know feel free i was just I, I mean i didn't really know what to do i mean i was just going to sort of just talk and if you if you want to if you want to ask questions along the way this, i'm very happy to do so this is great uh, i know i'm going to learn some things so uh, I don't, don't worry. You don't have to ask me to interrupt. Uh, it's kind yeah, of a yeah. habit of mine. So, no, but please, if you I'll feel like to... I'm, if if you feel like this is uh, uh, um, going a bit hardcore, then you know, and you want me to explain okay. it a bit more depth, then Thanks please do. Thanks for giving so, me what... power of attorney, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one, the first, the first one is, I just want to set the scene right because I think you know a lot of people have talked about this. The Fed are now going to proactively move target. A PC inflation of two percent. Um, they want to allow that to moderately moderately exceed that for two percent for some time, which is the yellow line that you you should be able to see here. Um, that so that white line being the two percent target, and this is inflation here. You can see just the six month average in the green. So you know that's a, that's a difficult task, uh, and you know I think part of the reason why we've seen markets under a bit of pressure recently is because the message from you know people like James Bullard, um, Charlie Evans. Um, Powell coming out and trying to clear things up is that the Fed really uh, are very misaligned with their messaging at the moment. And, and I think when, when we get to December, there's going to be a, a, some significant changes. Once we get past the election, once we get into December, I think there's going to be some significant changes. The other point is that they, they want the economy to reap ma- maximum employment. So there's three different factors. And, and effectively, what they want is nirvana. They want, you know, they want their cake and eat it because these kind of conditions to get full employment, which if you look at their economic projections was 4.1%, they want all of these three things to happen at one time. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult for them to do. In fact, it's, some would say that that's kind of an impossible task given the, the history. If we go into this chart here, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the euro dollar futures. So this is a tradable interest rate market. I used to trade this back at one of the US banks. Uh, you can trade Fed funds and obviously swaps and various factors, but you can see here, this is the current Euro dollar contract. And what we're doing is we're, we're looking at the yield and going up, really trying to add 25 basis points to this just to find out really, and this is what we do is, is to try and understand when the first rate hike is being priced based on the anticipation of the Fed delivering those three um, tasks that we had a look at. And you can see here that this sort of cross section here comes through in June, 2024. So the market's saying at the moment, Based on it's kind of finger in the air stuff, really. They're just yeah. saying we're we're taking a guess that, that, that the the first rate hike is going to be somewhere around June 24. Now, I think I think those rate expectations will get moved dramatically forward if we get fiscal stimulus. It's all about fiscal stimulus now. Maybe that comes after the election. Maybe that comes, you know, in in 2021, 22. Who knows? But um, it's all about fiscal now and monetary policy really complementing fiscal going forward. But just to set the scene. Um, we have this idea that the market is is sort of anticipating the first rate hike in June 2024. What's important, Dale, if we go back to this chart here, and and, and not a lot of people pick this out, and I think this is really, really, really key. If you have a look at the statement that they said um, in in July, they said they were going to be buying assets at least at the current pace to sustain smooth market functioning and thereby fostering the effective transmission of monetary policy to broader financial conditions. So they're just trying to make sure that the monetary system works well. But the change, which not so many people picked up, was that they've added this little extra bit here, which is to to continue making a smooth market functioning, but to foster accommodative financial conditions. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means that the, the Fed put is very much in play. It means that if there's any tightening in financial conditions, um, then, then they will buy U.S. Treasuries and they will buy mortgage-backed securities. They have told us in this statement and the new changes, if we do see a tightening of financial conditions, 
that we're going to get more asset purchases, which takes me to this chart, because this is, for me, a really, really key situation. There's all these different indices that you can you can get. You can go to the St. Louis Fed website. You can have Bloomberg. You can, I think you might even be able to get it on TradingView. I'm not sure. But they package, these different companies package um, these financial conditions indices into one. Uh, and you might you might incorporate things like the S and P. You might incorporate the VIX. You might incorporate money market rates, um, the TED spread. You might incorporate credit spreads, and all of this to to understand what financial conditions indicate. Now, the Fed know that the tightening of financial conditions indicates that, you know that that will come back, and there will be a feedback loop into the real economy. Tighter financial conditions. Did you conditions. say TED spread, Chris? Yeah, that that would be that would be one that some people use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, going okay. Back I mean, I you know I used to trade it a lot. I it it's uh, not in most people's vocabulary. So that's T bills against uh, euro dollars, not euro Correct. currency, mm -hmm. euro dollars. Uh, the spread. And that was something that. Yeah, like yeah, a flight to quality different. type of exactly. spread. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a perception of counterparty risk. Right. And, um, you know, we were looking at that in 2008. It was one of the big things. But yeah, you can see right. here that the I, I like to look at the Goldman Sachs financial condition indices. And, and basically, when this is going lower, it means that financial conditions are, are, are easy and, and, and accommodative. And you can see here that they've started to tighten up a little bit. But this yeah. is where I, I start to say to myself, where is where where is the, the strike price for this this so-called Fed put? And and what does it mean when we go there? So. If we understand that the Fed now are saying that the, the financial conditions tighten, they will do more to, to more quantitative easing and more more asset purchases. Then I've got myself this situation where um, Goldman Sachs, if this if this starts to move higher, representing tighter financial conditions, the probability of QE will will increase. And there's uh, an indicator that I like to look at, which is um, a proprietary one from Citigroup, which is the probability of QE. At the moment, that stands around 83%. And that's had this just from this little tick up that we've seen in the tightening of financial conditions. So my belief is we get up to somewhere around here. And, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have a Bloomberg terminal, go to the St. Louis Fed website. They've got their own one there. That they look at which is correlated to this so i think if we get up to there then then i think the chance then that the fed come out and start doing more us treasuries and mortgage-backed purchases is, is 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 very much for sure so you know this for me is, is is really important if there's a tie to financial conditions the fed have now told us that they will start doing qe the question is is what does that actually mean for markets now how do they go about this Dale? how do they go about creating um, what is the impossible task? They failed miserably for, for for so long. It's not just about asset purchases, and and for me, the way they go about doing this is now is is real yields. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the U.S. dollar smile. Um, I, I have not. But, well, it's a, it's a theory that it's a theory. I mean, I could spend hours talking about this. To be fair, but basically, it's. <coughs> You look at this sort of the, this this line here. This is kind of how the, the dollar genuinely used to trade. So if we had a situation where the rest of the world's growth um, was catching and converging with the US, or the US growth was falling at a, a rapid rate, and the rest of the world was looking good, we tended to see the, the US dollar doing quite well. Um, and what we saw for periods when when the US dollar was strengthening, which was the US dollar exception exceptionalism story. And that's yeah. when the US dollar starts to strengthen. So this bit's a positive side. This is the right tail is, is a positive side. On the left side, this is when the dollar strengthens on safe haven flows. And so you've got when did the dollar depreciate? It's when you know the rest of the world is catching up. And I think that's kind of what we saw for a large period of this year. The rest of the world was looking okay. The US was no longer this kind of the best house in a in a bad neighborhood. It was, you know, it, it, the rest of the world was a catching up. You know, COVID was looking a little better in Italy and all those other factors. And and the and the dollar started weakening, um, and we obviously saw the trade weighted dollar under pressure. And I think it's because we saw this part of the, the the smile sort of working, and so yeah, I mean for people out there who've never heard of this, do, do go and Google the, the smile framework. It's 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 got a really good sort of anticipation of, of of how the dollar trades. You know, generally if you start seeing the, the high risk off environment, the high volatility environment, you tend to see the U.S. dollar appreciate. On negative factors, and then on the other side, if the U.S. dollar is looking better, if the U.S. is looking better relative to the rest of the world, you tend to see that situation. What the okay, Fed have Chris, uh, done? Can I just interject something? So, uh, the rest of the world has been catching up with the U.S., but when you look at Boris's 
and equities. Um, the S&P 500 uh, made new all-time highs. And then you look at something like the FTSE, which yeah. uh, only corrected. And a lot of the major world bourses uh, have not made new highs. I know they, you know, the composition's different. They don't have, uh, you know, uh, the fangs. Um, yeah. So is that is that saying? And I'm not. And on this recovery, um, does it look like the U.S. is still leading the way, and the stock market's giving us a correct message, or is it just kind of an aberration with what's happening with growth? Uh, some of the growth stocks here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, what, what I think what's happened with equities is a completely different story. I think that's okay. a, a momentum trade, and I think in the U.S. The, it, it's been down to and. Uh, it's been down to um, stimulus, yeah. Um, but I think the the idea here um, is. That, let me just go into this point because you'll you'll see you'll see this quite quite clearly in the next next couple of slides. This will okay. make a little bit more sense. This this idea that the dollar would significantly strengthen in in a risk off environment of uh, of old or um, significantly strengthen in in a in, in a period of of where the U.S. is is looking so much better. What the Fed have effectively done by allowing the, the economies to run hot now is they've separated that link. So the dollar now, if we get that, is is going to um, is going to strengthen, but but not by much, not by the same sort of magnitude that it would have done before, because the Fed have, have, have separated that link. But what the Fed are now trying to do is is this is whole model that that many people would would be fairly familiar with. Um, is, is, is they've changed this now. And what they're doing is, is the Fed are gonna go after real yields. And they've been going after real yields as their mechanism to make the economy stronger. And everything that you've seen has been revolved about, all of this whole situation has now just evolved into this idea to drive down real yields. So the question is, is what is real yields? And, you, and, then, and then you will see pretty clearly, Dale, exactly how this works. You see it all the time. You read a Bloomberg article, you read, you know, an FT article, you, you see someone on TV talking, oh, yeah, real yields are down, the dollar's down, you know, NASDAQ's up as a result. The question is, is what is it? The Fed need to influence inflation expectations. Governments need to influence inflation expectations. If you believe that Ferrari that you want to buy is going to be more expensive in six months' time, you'll buy it now, you buy purchases now. If you, if you can change behaviors, if you can create animal spirits, you will, you will create inflation. And at least that's the theory. So what we look at is, is, is a range of, of market-based inflation sort of estimates to measure inflation expectations. And inflation expectations breed inflation. If you have a look at these, these instruments here, the blue ones are called break-evens and uh, the five-year ones are break-evens. Uh, five-year break-evens. And basically what these, these measure is the average expected inflation over five years or 10 years, and there's a risk and a liquidity premium built in as well. In fact, the Fed on this lower chart here have built their own model, um, five-year forward break-even model, and it measures the expected inflation um, in the economy. You can see this around 1.65%. And you can see that inflation generally sort of follows. This is the, the one that the, the Fed actually target. It tends to follow this as well. So there is actually a tradable product in the market called break-evens, which measure inflation expectations. And it's the Fed's job and the, central, and, and the government's job to a lesser extent to create higher inflation expectations. This is everything now in central bank policy. If you understand why this is, so if you've got break-evens, what are break-evens? Well, you've got your nominal treasury yield. This is a US government bond. This is a 10-year government bond here. So that's is, this has been sort of trading sideways, as you can see. It's trading 65 basis points at the moment. But for the last, well, since, since March, this has been moving sideways. What's actually happened is you've got these, there's also another product called the Treasury Inflation Protected Security. And what happens is this gives you cash flows which are related to, in, to inflation. The higher the level of inflation, the higher the cash flows. With a US Treasury, you get coupons, you get interest payments twice a year. With Treasury Inflation Protection Securities, those 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 coupons or those those income streams that you're getting will will increase if inflation is increasing. So they're hedge against inflation. Now the difference between this normal U.S. Treasury bond and the inflation protected security, the difference between the two and tips, their Treasury inflation protected securities, you can actually trade these as an ETF. In fact, the Fed are actually one of the biggest holders now. The Fed have bought about twenty percent 
um, of, of the outstanding float. But if you look at the difference between a normal US Treasury and these tips, you get the, you get the break even level, which is the expected inflation over 10 years in the US. So we can actually measure inflation. And so it's the job of the Fed to boost inflation expectations, because as we saw here, if you can boost inflation expectations, you can boost inflation. You can push inflation up to that 2% target, and you can get it above that level for a period uh, of time. Chris, if I may inter interject, actually, the job of the Fed, if, I, I mean, I know what you mean, but actually, uh, theoretically speaking, the job of the Fed is the exact opposite. The job of the Fed is to main, maintain price stability, which up, up to some recent point, it was considered to have stable prices, which meant more or less close to zero inflation. They've now moved well, the goalposts you... because they want to achieve something specific. That's right. Yep. So they had a, they moved the two decade old uh, mandate to a new mandate of, of proactively driving inflation to 2%. And then exactly, and, and they and they kept moving it. I mean, initially they said that it has to be positive. Then they moved it again that uh, it has to be positive, uh, but below two percent. Then the two percent, instead of becoming a ceiling, became a target. And now the two percent <laughs> isn't even a target because what they've been telling us is that we need to average out inflation over time. So actually, inflation is over time, which they've never explained what over time means. Does it mean five years, ten years, twenty years? It has to be yeah. 2%, uh, which yep. makes no sense because if what you're afraid is deflation for every year in the past that has already passed and you did not have deflation, why is there a need to average that out? Well, I mean, this, they, they, I mean, no, I don't, I don't see a problem with disinflation. The, I'm just going off their mandate, which is they want they I, want I to agree create with you. higher prices. Actually, so they want to create higher prices. So they, thing. Well, yeah, I mean, they want to get the, the economy going. Um, but if you believe that, if you believe that 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 they are proactively trying to get it to there, I mean, how are they going to do that? That's the question that everyone's asking. If you, if you are going to try and create something that you failed to do for 20 years, that apart from a period in 2016, how on earth are you going to do that? So what we're looking for now is proof of, of, of how markets are responding um, through this reflationary situation. So what I'm just saying is that, that there is a way that we can look at this. And this is for, for people at home who, who've heard this idea of real yields. Um, this is the mechanism by which we look at. So we look at tips, we look at the difference between the treasury and we can work out what the, the inflation expected is between the two. Now, have a, if we have a look at the the correlation in markets, and this is where it becomes interesting. This is going back to Dale's point. So we've got real yields, five-year real yields. And if we measure them since April against the US dollar index, wow. which is a basket of currencies, we yeah. can clearly see now relationships like this don't last forever. Um, but I, I think what's happening now is if, if inflation expectations are being driven higher or what need to be driven higher, um, that's just going to create lower real yields, which is this treasury inflation protected security. So we've got um, you know, a, a very, you know, it's not one for one. I'd probably say this correlation, if you're looking at a 10-day rolling correlation, has obviously picked up quite sharply now. Um, but, you know, there's obviously periods here where, um, you know, the correlation breaks down a little bit. They're going in the same direction, but, you know, statistically, they're not, you know, it's not a perfect, perfect fit. But you can see that there, there is an influence here. Lower real yields are moving in line with the dollar. This is your point now, Dale. So we've got here um, five-year... Um, real yield, so inflation yeah. adjusted bond treasury yields, this white one. And what I've done is I flipped or inverted gold and also the NASDAQ. So obviously the NASDAQ's going up, but I've, right. I've just tried to show the relationship between the two. So we've got, we've got real yields going down. We've got the dollar going down. It's now started to reverse because real yields have started to move higher. And you've seen this very strong correlation between gold and the NASDAQ. It is one trade. It is one big momentum trade. The question is, in the short term, is what happens if real yields keep moving up? Are we going to continue to see the dollar strengthen? And is that going to see an unwind of the NASDAQ trade and, and, and the gold trade? And my view is that that probably is, is, is more than likely in the short term. Now, why do the Fed want... If the Fed want to drive down real yields, and we know that's had a negative effect on the dollar, and we know that real yields moving higher has had a positive effect on the dollar, 
If we have a look at this chart here, we can see the Citigroup Inflation Surprise Index. And this, this obviously goes up if inflation is beating expectations and moving in the right direction more broadly. And that's the blue line here. And then we've got the trade weighted US dollar, which is the green one. I've inverted that to, to show the relationship a little bit better. And, um, and you, you, can, you can see, you know, it's a bit messy because one's more, one's more of a higher frequency situation. But you can see here that I've put the dollar with a three month lead. And if the dollar's falling, which is the green one here, it's actually rising. It, it's actually falling at the time because I flipped this upside down. You can see this is actually a falling dollar has had a positive in, impact on inflation surprises um, in the US. It always so has, it makes, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's exactly right. So if you know that driving down real yields has a positive effect on the on the US, has a, a positive effect. Uh, driving down real yields has a negative effect on the dollar and, and, and a negative dollar has a positive effect on, on, on inflation. Why not go after real yields? The other thing is, is that it, it actually, it, it's actually really good for the world. I mean, not everywhere. I mean, you've seen, started seeing the ECB now start talking down. It's, you know, the ECB economist there, Mr. Lane, gave us an indicator above 120. But you can see here the um, the trade weighted US dollar on a year on year change basis. And again, I've inverted this against world trade volumes. Um, and you, you can see that there has been a, a relationship of sorts at some stage where, where a weaker US dollar has actually benefited world trade as well. So generally, you've actually seen a situation where um, where a weaker dollar will tend to sort of drive world trade. And so on the whole, because commodity prices are going up and various factors, a weaker dollar is generally good for the globe. That's why we like reflation. Have a look at this chart here, because this is this is kind of what we need to see. This is where we need to go from here. Okay, so what we've got is is we've got the the ten year Treasury, and that's telling us a story in itself. And then you've got as the markets have come out of their March doldrums with fiscal stimulus and and various other factors. You've seen um, inflation expectations, the break even, which remember is the difference between treasury inflation protected securities and the government treasury. And that's been moving higher. So it's copper, the, perp, the orange line. You've seen oil prices moving higher. They've sort of stagnated a little bit now. Um, you've seen in the S&P, you've seen the cyclical sectors outperforming the defensive sectors. And that generally happens when you come out of, um, uh, you know, Recessions. into a new reflation, well, out of into a new reflationary cycle. Okay. And so you've, you've seen this all moving up as one trade. And that's kind of what we've been doing. Why? Because real yields have been moving lower. It's a reflation trade that's been working. The question is, is it's now started to be called into, called, called into question, as you can see. You know, copper started rolling over a little bit. You've seen the defensive sector starting to outperform. Break-even rates have started to fall a little bit. You know, how much more has that got? You know, if that if that does start rolling over, then I think in the short term you could see a situation where that dollar continues to strengthen a little bit. You could see a little bit where you know some of the reflation trades in in the equity market may struggle, such as the Nasdaq. And I think that that's something that we're watching there. So th this is all one trade. And what's the central focus here? It's reflation yields. And it's driven. In the currency markets, it's really How interesting. How long could the Fed keep the ten-year in that re in that rectangle, Chris? I mean, uh, well, this is you know that rectangle you know looks like an EKG of someone in a coma. <laughs> I've commented. So uh, I was wondering how long can they defend both the upside a little over 80 and, you know, we've had plenty of reasons for it to, you know, make new lows, um, even, you know, with the COVID thing and it, it doesn't. So are we just going to move sideways? Have they taken, are there bond vigilantes that could reawaken and do something about this? So what's going to happen now, if, if financial conditions tighten, which is that, that, that chart I showed you, the, 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 you know, then, then I think then we'll start hearing Fed making more noises. But we've got a Fed meeting two days after the election. It's going to be a non-event. But if you go into the December meeting, it's my base case that I believe that we're going to see um, some, some fairly big action coming from the Fed. I think they're going to show a much more cohesive force. 
you know, Steve made the point that, that the Fed are all over the place. And I think that's why the S&P's pulled back 10% recently is because they're just all over the place. And I think they need to be a cohesive message. I think what happens in this situation is, is we will see the Fed increase their bond buying. And I think they'll also increase the duration, um, i.e. what the length, the maturities that they, they start buying as well. And the reason I think that is because the data started to fall over now. You know, if you look at the, the, the fiscal impulse, you know, this is one from JP Morgan. We can see the fiscal impact that we had. Um, yeah. that, that really increased that, their projections that starts to dissipate. You know, if you have a look at the, the real-time activity indicators from Jefferies, they did a really good one. You can see it really pushing higher. Um, if we don't see a phase four fiscal stimulus, which is one which is currently being debated and, and given that the empl employment benefits run off fairly soon, you know, we're going to start seeing GDP and personal income start to start to pull back a little bit. You know, if you have a look at these break-even levels, which is the orange one here, the inflation expectations, as I say, moving higher, and they've sort of correlated with um, an improvement in economic data, an improvement in the in 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 data beating consistently. You know, if data starts rolling over from here, which we suspect it's going to, because a lot of these stimulus measures are going to roll off, um, then inflation expectations are going to fall, and that's just going to tighten financial conditions as we go into the election and we're going to see volatility in the election. And then that's when the Fed start giving us the idea that they're going to do something big in the December meeting. And we start seeing that reflationary trade coming on. But the point being is now is that there's only so much the Fed can do. If we really want to create higher data and, and stronger data, which we can see, we can prove here, um, has had an effect on, on, on economics. As you can see here, this is the, um, the white line is something that everyone can have a look at. You can go to the, the website, New York Fed website, and they create this weekly economic indicator, which has all these various factors here. And as that's moved up, um, you know, you have seen break even levels moving up as well. So average inflation expectations have moved moving up and that's been one of the parts of the reason why real yields have moved lower. And that's why the dollar has fallen. So if we do see a situation where this, this this starts to roll over again, you know that that's going to have an implication there. So it's the data. Now, how does data get affected by central bank policy? It's very hard to do, and that's why we need fiscal. We need more fiscal stimulus, and that's why you know I can I, I think I'm sort of running out on time at the moment, but I've got a big playbook on on what's happening with the election because I think fiscal stimulus is everything, uh, and I think a blue wave would be significantly dollar bearish. Um, that means taking over the Senate too, presidency and the Senate. Well, so we we know that we know that the 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 economy needs more stimulus to to get um, inflation expectations higher. If inflation expectations are getting higher, then we know that real yields are going to fall. Uh, and what I've done is I put together this this playbook here, Blue Wave. That's where they, you know we get Biden in the White House, we get them in the House, and also the Senate. And and, and me, in my view, that, that that's actually going to be maybe initially strong for the for the dollar, but I think over the longer term, we're going to see significantly lower real yields. And I think as a result, the dollar will go on a weakening trend. That will be very very positive for the S and P. I think that'll be very positive for gold, and I think that will be modestly negative for for crude. The base cases we'll probably get one of these two situations here, and then you know obviously. Uh, we'll see what happens with, with real yields in that situation. But what we want to also have a look at is in is in in the currency markets. Is, that, is have a look at the, the 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 correlation here with that reflation trade. So we've got the correlation here between real yields, so inflation adjusted bond yields, relative to Aussie yen, Aussie CAD, Aussie dollar, and you can see here that over the last one year, the ten day rolling correlation is negative um, point eight four. So in layman's terms, what that means is for um, is that 84% of Aussie dot Aussie yen can really be explained by break it, by 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 lower yields. So as 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 we're seeing um, uh, real yields falling, Aussie yen's been moving higher. You know, so 84% right. of the variance in Aussie yen can be explained by this one variable. So. If we do start, so if we see a, um, a situation where the government comes in and, and they promise fiscal stimulus, economic start improving going forward, 
then what's the currency statistically? This is not me just coming out and plucking numbers out of the air. This is actually using you know statistical information. Aussie yen has for every every one unit of 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 of, of, of a fall that you're seeing there in, in in the real yield, you know this has moved up by 0.84. And you can see Aussie CAD's been the next one, Aussie dollar. So these have been your reflationary trades. So if the Fed can come out in December and start really going after their mandate, which is a big if, and that needs to be backed up by fiscal, then we can actually see pretty categorically um, that these are the trades which have worked and will probably continue to work. On the other side, you know, if we see the dollar continue to rally and we see real yields fall, uh, rising and inflation expectations falling because economic data is going to deteriorate, which is my base case for the next couple of months, um, then these are the trades which will probably come unwound as well pretty quickly. You know, what I can have a look at, Dale, and I can get, I can get pretty hardcore about this situation, is, is have a look at real yields on a relative basis, you know, and this is what we look at in, in, in the strategy basis. So, you know, what we saw... Um, is the relationship between Aussie dollar, which is the blue line here, yeah. um, and Aussie um, real yields minus that of US treasuries or, or real yields in, in the US. And what we could see that you go back into the beginning of the year, into late to 19, 2019, is that Aussie government bonds on, a, on an inflation adjusted basis uh, traded at a discount um, of about 50 basis points less than, than US treasuries. But as the Fed have come out and, and lowered rates down to zero, and they've done all these other factors that have, that have been more stimulatory, we've now got a situation where Aussie um, real rates, real returns in the government bond market are trading 47 basis points or nearly half a percent higher than that in the US. And you can see that that shot up like, you know, shot up really well. And that's put valuational support into the Australian dollar. So not only have you had that, 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 that reflation trade, what's the best way to, to, to trade reflation? You know, if you're seeing commodity prices moving up because the dollar's weakening, because equity prices are moving up, people are feeling richer, or at least that's the, the perception. What's the best way to play reflation? It's through the Australian dollar because commodity prices are moving up. It's a commodity currency. Um, you know, China's doing quite well on a relative basis and all these factors. But now what we've also seen is this really big mechanism in the US, which was carry the idea that you could be paid to be holding US dollars, the Fed have completely removed carry from the market. They've taken all the carry from the market. So all this idea of carry means income, whether you're in the bond right. market, equity market, or in effects, it means just means getting paid, getting income. And effectively what's happened here, if you want to use this as a carry vehicle, is that you're actually getting paid more on a, on a real basis, an inflation-adjusted basis, to be in the Aussie bond, bond market. And we're not talking about cross-currency basis swaps and, and hedging costs and bits and pieces. But you can see here is what the Fed have effectively done is they've pulled down real yields so substantially so far that, that it's making other currencies look attractive. You know, you can see that here. So have a look at this in Europe. You know, you can see this period here where the difference between German and US real yields was quite highly correlated with what we're seeing in euro dollar. I mean, obviously, if I was to hone in on this area here, you'd see it was, that, that relationship was much stronger and also much stronger here. And what we've seen here in this part here is, is the euro dollar's blue. And you can see here, this is the inflation adjusted German Bund minus the real yield in the US, is that German real yields have really moved much higher. I mean, at this stage here, we were German... Uh, 10-year real yields, inflation-adjusted yields were negative at 200 basis points. They're right. now negative 26 basis points. So what the Fed have done is they've, they've taken down real yields so substantially relative to other countries because they boot, you know, there's been this big reflation trade which has boosted inflation expectations. They've kept nominal treasury yields very, very flat. And that's really created this outperformance here. So you've seen this situation where the, the, all the carries come out the dollar um, and you, you could almost argue that the dollar's cheap on this basis here. I, mean, I don't think it is. I think you'll see convergence. The other aspect, of course, is, is, is if you look at inflation um, surprises in Europe and you look at it relative to the US, which is this bottom pane, and you can see as the euro has been strengthening, that inflation, expect, uh, inflation surprises have started really outperforming relative to Europe. So this is why the ECB are a bit worried because, you know, if we do see, you know, real yields continue to fall, and as I say, everyone's talking about that, then um, 
the chance of creating in, inflation in the US is significantly right. higher than that in, in Europe. And that's something there that we're looking at. If we go in Japan uh, and have a look at relative rates, differentials that we're seeing there. So you've got um, the white line there being um, uh, what you're getting as a, as a real return in the US Treasury market relative to Japan. You can see it's collapsed. So, you know, at one stage in, in, you know, in 2019, you, you had an advantage of about 150 basis points. So if I was an international fund manager and I'm looking for a, a real return, an inflation adjusted return, which of course we do, you know, I'm getting 150 basis points um, in the treasury market relative to Japan. Um, that's all just completely gone. And now we're actually getting negative, we're getting penalized because real rates in Japan are, are actually positive. So why do we love the yen from a, from a valuation perspective? Because they've got positive real rates. Because the Japanese cannot create inflation expectations. Because the Japanese cannot do anything with their bond market. You actually get a real, a positive real return. It's very, very positive. So anyone who looks at their dollar yen chart and, and says, you know, this, 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 we've just seen this massive rally in the NASDAQ. We've seen this massive rally in the S&P, which would traditionally be really good for dollar yen. You know, what, why, why is this broken down? Well, it's because um, people want the yen because you can get paid positively. Now, what I've actually done, and again, again, this is getting a bit hardcore, but I think it's really important for people to understand this. If you're understanding fundamentals, you know, if you hedge your US Treasury exposure using um, these things called cross-currency basis swaps, so if I'm a Japanese fund manager and Japanese funds have some of the biggest funds in, in the entire world, if I go and buy US Treasury and hedge that exposure back into yen, I get a 21 basis point return. Uh, sorry, 24 basis point return. But if I, if I compare that to what I get in Japan, which is pretty much nothing in the JGB market, it's a positive return. So what you've got Japanese funds is buying US Treasuries and then hedging that exposure back to the yen. So again, you've got to ask yourself, why does the yen not sell off? They're talking it down. You've seen this massive rally. It's because Japanese funds have increased their hedging ratios. You've got this situation where you've got positive real yields in Japan. It makes the yen very, very, very attractive. Any, any, any rally that you see, well, that I see in dollar yen at the moment, I want to sell it because I know. Like funds last week, Chris, last week, uh, there was a recovery in that. Well, I'm looking at levels. Yen. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think right now, um, as part of my framework, you know, I'm starting to see signs that this, that, that, that reflation is starting to abate a little bit because economic data started to roll over. Um, but there will be a point, I think, post the election where the reflation trade will go on. I'm not talking about right here or now, but I think for 2021, if this, what we've seen in this period where, you know, real yields are going lower because inflation expectations have been going up and this reflation trade has just been centered on real yields falling and the dollar weakening and then everything else has been a derivative of that. Weaker, um, stronger gold, stronger NASDAQ, stronger growth stocks, cyclicals outperforming defensives, copper working, lumber working, all of these things have been working. Why? Because inflation expectations have been pushed higher, economics have improved, and all of those factors have worked really well. Um, and then you've got the fact that, that the US real yields are falling on a relative basis relative to all of these other factors. And so for me, that, 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 that's everything right now. And this is why when I look at all these factors, when, when I talk to retail traders and they're saying, oh, you know, I'm trading fundamentals, I'm like, but you're trading the wrong fundamentals. You, you don't know what you're looking at. You know, you, you, you've got to really understand. Um, and I'm not saying this, what I'm saying here is, is, is absolutely correct, but I'm looking for, for correlations. I'm looking for relationships. I'm looking that the market is actually looking at this. And I'm saying, are you looking at real yields? And they're saying no. And I'm like, well, why not? What are you looking at? And so this is why I think a lot of people when they're, when, when they're trading and, and, and starting out trading, um, when they, when they start using fundamentals, you know, that then they're, they're generally looking at the wrong thing, which is kind of why you look at price, right? You have to look at price. You have to look at flow. You have to look at all these other factors that are happening because it's the aggregation of all of these behaviors that are taking place because fundamentals, when it comes to, to, to understanding what's actually making these things move, it's, it's very, very difficult to do, which is when I talk to clients and when I talk to, to people about this, you know, we put this out in the research, but, the idea here is that 
you know, it, it can be very difficult to understand what is actually making things move. You know, every week on a Thursday, there's the Japanese flow data, which the Ministry of Finance put out. We can all get hold of that. It comes out, everyone gets to get, gets to look at it. You know, you guys, um, you can see what the Japanese funds are doing, whether they're buying foreign stocks, foreign bonds, domestic fund, uh, domestic bonds, domestic equities. And you can see what these guys are doing. And it's part of the sort of flow process that you've been seeing. But why, what, for me, you know, I understand that the, the Japanese yen is an incredibly attractive currency. Why? Because if we were to see a risk-off environment going into the election, volatility kicks up. We know that the Japanese yen is a great place to be in that in those in those risk off environments. We also know that it really didn't take play, didn't take part in what was a really positive environment that we saw between March and recent times. Why? True. Because the Fed managed to bring down real yields, and you get paid to be in Japanese yen. You get, you know, you, they've removed all the carry, um, and and so that's what we've been seeing. Um, I want to sort of just well, touch please. on, yeah. So th this is really where we've been. I want to just touch on. I mean, just just give me a, how, how long how long have we got on 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 the presentation left? Uh, we need to wrap it up here in a few minutes. Go go ahead, Chris. I, I just want I just want to say right. We need we need fiscal stimulus. We need fiscal stimulus. Absolutely. If we get and that's why I'll uh, like, wire you ten grand. Would that help? <laughs> well, I need fiscal stimulus. <laughs> let me tell you something about. We all, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something about the election. So you can you can. The good thing about the, the, the Democrats in this is that they want to go big on, on the spending. I'm not saying that's more. I don't have yeah. a political allegiance, but they want to go big on the spending. The bigger the spending, the better. The, they get closer towards MMT. That's, really, that's what it's all about. It's about deficit spending. The Fed then come in with, with – and you may get inflation. And you may actually get inflation expectations, and that trade continues to work. What I'm going to say, though, is, is look into this election, though, because – if you have a look at the, the volatility structures, two month dollar yen implied volatility minus one month all time highs. Dollar wow. CNH near all time highs. For people who aren't au okay fait with the options market, um, implied volatility is the expected movement in, in a currency over that period, up or down. But it just it's it's you know anticipated movement. And you can trade that and it's based on on, on options prices. But you, what you're seeing is that two months Two month expiry options on dollar yen are trading at a record premium. So markets are expecting movement here. If you have a look at dollar yen three month, you go this and it gets even higher in the bond market, higher. This is the really big one. You've got the election here. So this is the term premium of the S&P. So we're looking at put volatility. And I'll try and make this uh, for people who are not au fait with options. Um, the options market is fantastic for giving us great color about everything. This is the election here. So the implied volatility in the S&P for put options is 30%. That's an annualized standard deviation number. But what's interesting here is that the volatility is rising into the election, but then it rises even more afterwards going into the new year. What does that tell me? The markets are expecting, markets are expecting massive movement. Yeah. But they're also expecting massive movement afterwards and they're buying put protection afterwards because they think this is contested. They think this goes to yeah. a contested election, right? And there's going to be right. carnage on the streets. There's going to be civil war, Chris, whatever it's going to be. Chris, I, I think there is another explanation for it. We know that there is a lot of stuff that is currently uh, being papered over, a lot of real problems. And I think besides the possibility of a contested election, there is also the markets pricing in that some of the problems uh, will have to come in the forefront uh, following the election, no matter who becomes the next president, if it's Trump remaining or uh, Biden comes on. Yep. Yep. I mean, great I mean, presentation. Great presentation. There's, there's a million, there's a all, I'm, all I'm saying here is that the, the market's expecting movement into the yeah. election. And a lot of movement afterwards as well. So that's yeah. going to be something that we're. So looking we at. need to uh, fasten our seatbelts, Chris. Right. Well, I mean, what, what's I mean, this is priced in. What actually may happen if we get an outcome? If we actually get an outcome on the day, and someone accepts it, then we may see a massive relief rally. Let's just think that the market is priced for carnage here. Right. If we don't get that, if we get an outcome, whether it's a Biden or Trump, we may get 
the market is telling me from the options, they're expecting carnage. They're expecting contested. Right. This is going to go to violence on the street, whatever it's going to be. If that doesn't happen, realize volatility is going to come in much lower. So this is really an interesting one. So I'll wrap it up. My view here is that what I've tried to explain very, very quickly um, is that for the Fed to achieve its three-pronged mandate, which is very, very hard to do, one, they need fiscal stimulus, and that won't come at the moment. It has to come from a strong government. It has to come from either a, you know, a, a, a Trump sweep or it has to come from a Biden sweep. We need strong government. We need a strong full Congress. I'm not sure if we get that, but we need fiscal economics improve and then the fed come in um, with their strong mandate which i think will come in december if they can boost inflation expectations which we've looked at through break evens which is the difference between nominals and treasuries we've seen that reflation trade will continue aussie cad will work aussie dollar aussie yen all of those things will work and continue to work but if we see inflation expectations rolling over in the short term which is what we're seeing now it boosts real yields great for the us dollar which is what we're seeing now. So my view is, is that, and what I've tried to prove in a very short period of time, is that it's all about inflation expectations and what that means for real yields. And if real yields are going up, the dollar's going up, and a lot of these trades will be unwound. So it's all about real yields. It's all about the US dollar. And that's going to be really central post the election as well. Thank you, Chris. What a great fundamental presentation. I, I see why Pepper Stone recruited you. <laughs> so thank uh, really thank you so much chris i mean i learned a lot i'm mainly a technical guy and you've given me some things to reconsider especially my stance in u.s dollar yen so uh thank you for your time today and well, my, uh, my, glad, my, 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 have time for my, questions and glad that we my, have my, an association well my, my view is is that um is you can have these fundamental frameworks but you follow the technicals right that, that that's the, the yeah. one part of the, the framework the, the thing with the FX market is you've got a million different things that are aggregating into price, you know, um, you know, real money accounts, um, hedge fund activity, leveraged accounts, all this kind of stuff all aggregated into price. And, 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 and I can come out of all these different correlations and everything, but you've got to follow the money flow. You've got to follow the aggregated. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to put those, those fundamentals and that gives me the framework making money out of that is the next step and that's where you know we go into a whole new presentation because that's the framework which gives me understanding about what to look for and, and what to follow um but you, you the technicals is, is is you know is so important the money management obviously the position sizing is is what you're doing with trading in those situations there as well um, okay. but yeah if anyone wants if anyone uh, wants to get in touch with i was going to say if anyone wants to get in touch with me um, there's my Twitter handle. I do a daily daily wrap for for clients and 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 um, for other people as well. Uh, you can see um, all my details there. We're doing so we're doing a set of uh, webinars as well, which may may be of interest to to, to people. there, touching on some of these factors as well. So um, yeah, do reach out um, if if you yeah. I'm sure we've got a lot of questions and found what's just been said. It's been a whirlwind. Unfortunately, so, uh, no time for it. Uh, thank you very, very much for being here and have a wonderful night because it's night, Chris, right? Yeah, Chris Weston yeah. at Chris. Pepperstone. Thank you very much. Take care.